Warning, Tongue and Geek contains heavy spoilers. If you haven't read, watched, or played the content being reviewed this episode, know that we will definitely spoil major plot points. Also, this show isn't for kids. We use words like and and it would take too much time and effort to edit them all out. Please don't tell our moms. Lovely listeners, and welcome to Tongue and Geek, where two more white guys on the internet share their unsolicited opinions on all things geeky. I'm Isaac. I am Tyler. And today we're reviewing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Last Ronin, a five-issue comic miniseries published in 2020 by IDW and written by Kevin Eastman, Peter Laird, Tom Waltz, and Andy Kuhn, with art from Kuhn and Ben Bates. Tyler, want to give us any background on this one? A very surprising tidbit um, during my two seconds of research <laughs> is that uh, this story was an outline uh, all the way back in the in the late eighties. Really, like seven? Yeah, Eastman and Laird just kind of had this idea of um, end of the timeline um, story where one turtle was spoilers still alive. Mm-hmm. The last <laughs> Ronin, you would say. The last Ronin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Title gives it away. Um, <laughs> so that's cool how it's just kind of been on the back burner for like 40 years. I figured it had um, been around. I figured the idea had been around a while, at least since like the old man Logan took off. And then everything started doing the whole dystopian, everybody's dead but me story. Yeah. What's cool is that this story um, was kind of like, one of the big comics of the year mm-hmm. um, when it was published and like it became like so big like it's inspired a bunch of like fan animations it's getting an official video game adaptation yeah like, described as like god of war but with the turtles so that's wild um this is like one of the more impactful team and t stories that the franchise has had in a very very long time it's brought attention to the <laughs> tmnt franchise outside of the television show because everybody i think when we think tmnt we think of the tv series usually but tmnt started as a comic and this mm-hmm. and i've not read the idw comic but if it's anywhere near so on par with so this good. level yeah i'm definitely gonna start checking them out because like holy shit was this a good Mini series for I don't think this has anything to do with the IDW continuity. It's not like their uh, lore or anything that they've established in the IDW run, but it's it's, yeah, it's just kind of, it's kind of an else worlds to coin it to take a phrase from DC. It's out of continuity, but can be the end of like the comic continuity. I think from Mirage, mm-hmm. it's, it started as um, a story under Mirage comics, which is always fun. I going back to our Hulk comics that we did. Um, the end there was such a good sort of ending story for the Hulk. I love when comics take these established characters that have gone on forever, and it's finally like, okay, we can't actually stop making these characters because this is our <laughs> money bag. Like this is the horse we're gonna keep beating, the dead horse. But like, here's what may happen if we ever did decide to stop. So, <laughs> yeah, boy, are these stories. Just ever so depressing. They're always the so time. bleak. They're always <laughs> so <laughs> bleak. Goddamn dark. <laughs> I guess bad. let's just get into this a little brief synopsis of the story. So we're introduced. We see one of the Ninja Turtles sneaking into clearly like a post-apocalyptic New York. There's like these cyborg sentries all over the place, flying cards, you know, future dystopia stuff. He's sneaking into New York from the sewers. And he gets up to the very top of this huge skyscraper, and we find out that he's trying to kill the grandson of the Shredder, who is... What was that guy's name? Hiroku. Oroku Hiroto. Oroku Hiroto. We're talking about a thing we can't Yeah, well, we remember. can't. Yeah, we can't pronounce any foreign names. I shouldn't have said foreign. We'll cut that out. 
<laughs> anything that is not a white American name, I have trouble pronouncing because I grew up in the fucking Bible Belt. <laughs> That's not That's on terrible. anyone else. That's on me. He's the grandson of the Shredder. The Ninja Turtle that we've been following is trying to kill him. He fails in an assassination attempt, and he tries to kill himself in the act of seppuku. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and by the end of issue one, we find out that this Ninja Turtle, the last of the Ninja Turtles, is Michelangelo. So, big spoiler there. That's the big reveal at the end of issue one, that Mikey is the only one left, and he's trying to avenge his family and finally put an end to the Foot Clan. Yeah, um, that was the big hook of the first issue, is who is this remaining turtle? Because he's, like, you've never seen a turtle before. He's got a black bandana instead of one of the colored bandanas. And he's huge! And he's <laughs> gigantic. He's got, like, dark clothes on. He's fully pretty much covered. Mm-hmm. He's not a teenager anymore. These nope. guys get he's big in their adulthood. <laughs> They're huge. <laughs> he's which is actually, a, which is an interesting plot point that mm -hmm. I was expecting. Um, yeah, like the mutations got more advanced in, as he got older and it made him stronger and bigger and, like, more durable. He falls off a skyscraper by the end of issue one and it beat, like, it hurts the crap out of him, but he's still alive. Yeah, the, the mutagen and what it does is actually a, a plot thread throughout the whole thing, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's got I all of the turtle's weapons, which is awesome he's and also very depressing. <laughs> yes. Um, end of issue one. First time Tyler cried reading this comic book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where do you want to start uh, with the actual discussion of this, though? Jeez. Oh, um, I knew... First, we like we love to give background, and mm -hmm. I love to wax just nostalgic and philosophical about all this shit that I love. I'm a turtle fan. Mm -hmm. I've loved the turtles since I was a little kid. They're a franchise, and they're characters that just I, I like to revisit every once in a while. I'm just like I'm in a turtles mood, and I'll start watching one of the shows, go through the movies, pick up some of the comics. Just they're they're always just kind of there in the background, and when I'm really in the mood for some turtles. Then I get really in the mood for Turtles, and I, like, go through it. So I have a lot of affection for them, of course. I knew going into this that it would be sad, it would be dark, that there was only one Turtle alive, but I didn't expect it to kind of hit me like it did. Oh, it hits. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because you, you have all of this personal attachment to these characters that you have uh, grew up with in various different mediums, and then, like... <laughs> They're experiencing, one of them is experiencing this massive loss of their entire family. So all of that just history you have with them is just kind of like pushed to the front and you're just like, oh my God, mm -hmm. like, this it hits so hard. This story doesn't do anything new. It does all of the yeah. same story beats that you'd expect from this sort of like post-apocalyptic one last survivor story. But like, goddamn, if those tropes don't just work. <laughs> Especially with something as absurd and fun as the Ninja Turtles franchise. Like, the brotherly dynamic of those characters is so charming when it's done well to see mm -hmm. only one of them left. It's like, even just the concept of only one of them being left is enough to get you misty-eyed. Yeah, <laughs> it just really is. <laughs> <laughs> when I when I just heard the synopsis of this when they announced it, like new mini series from the t t original Team and T's uh, Team and T creators coming, where mm -hmm. there's only one surviving turtle. I'm like, what? No, that no. <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, and let's let's talk about let's talk about the fact that this is Mikey. That it's Mikey because yep. I think I think Michelangelo more than any of the other turtles is sort of a hit or miss with people because mm -hmm. in a lot of iterations he's the you know the comic relief which in pretty much any story can be hit or miss with people, but in a series with as absurd as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, at times it feels like, why do we even have a comic relief character? It's unnecessary in this weird, absurd world we've created. I like Mikey. He was my favorite when I was younger. I don't know if I'd still call him my favorite, but like when he's done well... You've got this real sense of, like, heart from him that goes beyond just him being the wacky party dude. He's also sort of the sensitive one, the one who cares about others, is more willing to befriend people than his brothers, uh, is m less likely to ch act on just violence alone. So for him to be the last one, also being the youngest, is just, mm -hmm. whoo, it's something. <laughs> it's, yeah. <clears throat> it, it makes the most thematic sense for the from the character's perspective. Mm-hmm. 
because before I knew it was Mikey, I'm like, I want it to be Donatello because Donatello never really gets a spotlight. Mm -hmm. But reading through it, it it just makes so much sense that it's Mikey because, like, he's the one with the most open heart. Like, it would be too cliche if it was Raph, you know, who I just assumed it would be at first. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Raph. It'd still be kind of cliche if it was just Leo because, you know, he's the leader and... You, you could tell the story well with all four of them. Well, it, it would be a different story with each of them, I yeah. think. If it had been Leo, it would be a story about a leader failing his team. It would be mm-hmm. like him completely... I think he would have been even darker than Mikey here. He would have been much more prone to violence and more outrage. He would have become more like Raph, almost, in that he's just so guilt-ridden as having failed his brothers. With Mikey, we get the youngest one, the one who's already kind of seen as, you know, the weak link, the loser, the, you know, screw-up, the, the, the fun-loving one, but he's not really that good in a fight. And he's the last one standing. He's already got sort of this inferiority complex built in and for it to just be pushed to the limits of him being like I can't believe I failed them all once again story of my life literally in that ending scene in issue one he's about to commit seppuku he's got like Leo's broken blade in his hand and he says I'm sorry father I failed please forgive me and it's like damn it Mikey. <laughs> and he's just like, I miss them so much. I'm like, oh he's got God. all of his brother's weapons laid out in front of him. Their bandanas draped across them. He's got his father's book of ninjutsu list lessons sitting in front of him. It's just, oh, God. Yeah, it's a gut wrencher from the very first issue. But mm-hmm. he isn't alone. He no. is not alone. No. Because this, this story bounces back and forth between the present and, and the past mm-hmm. um, consistently and very well structured because sometimes the, the nonlinear aspect of a, of a big story like this in comics can be kind of tedious, but mm-hmm. I think they do really well with it This in this one. He's found by some resistance fighters. One of them is the daughter of Casey and April. Who brings, brings him, him to back, her mom. Who brings him to her mom. And April's... <laughs> <laughs> she's older, she's battle-hardened, she's got prosthetic limbs. Like, yeah. Just the, describing it, this sounds like something that only the 90s edgy comic phase would have produced. It sounds very cliche, and, you know, but on a surface like level, right it is. right on that line. It's, like, right on that line of being, like, too much. Mm-hmm. But they, 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 they find a way to ride that line perfectly, and not just like, oh, my God, mm-hmm. whatever, too much. It um, is dark. It is grim dark, but, like... It is set in a way that is very true to these characters and this world. It doesn't feel like, oh, this is completely outside of the lines for Ninja Turtles, which the Ninja Turtles comics started out as like a grim, dark thing anyway. Yeah, it, it like, started off as kind of a parody of um, 80s comics that got dark at the time, like Daredevil and The Dark Knight Returns. Mm-hmm. So for it to become something that can legitimately hold a story of this tone is just hilarious irony, is that it be- it was started as parody and suddenly it's like, oh no, we can actually tell stories like this <laughs> and actually have it hold up. Casey and April's daughter, and this is um, where the first kind of flashback happens because, of course, we have to learn one by one who died first, how they died, and all that, just to really just hammer in the nail. Because mm-hmm. um, that's that's the real interest in these sort of stories, I think. With these kind of stories, you pretty much know what's going to happen from start to finish. You're going to have the last one who's lost all hope, all sense of self-worth. They're going to gradually regain their hope through connection with others. And by the end, they're going to die a sad but somewhat triumphant death, having overcome whatever goal they had. Um, mm-hmm. but what's always interesting is seeing how we got here in the first place, because that's where the variations occur. Um, not every story gets us here to the same place in the same way. Uh, on that note, this is a weirdly sad, but also sort of interesting conversation topic. Who do you think has the best of death in the flashbacks? <laughs> <laughs> The best death, is, and this could be my bu- character bias, mm-hmm. but um, Donatello's is the one that um, got me the most. Really? Yeah. They all seem very fitting for the characters. Mm-hmm. And I kind of like how almost unceremonious the death of Leonardo and Casey are. <sighs> um, because 
you know, they're they're fighting Baxter Stockman's freaking robots and like holding the fort and stuff like that, and it, it explodes. Yeah, he just and blows them up. Kind of fire and ex- fiery explosion, and I, I like the futility of that. I like how they didn't want to like manufacture some like heroic sacrificey thing for Leonardo. Mm. Um, Raphael's is completely on point. I was going to um, say, I think can- I like Raph's best because it's it's most true to his character. We get the flashback. The foot have ambushed the turtles and Splinter. Splinter is grievously wounded, and Raph, obviously in a fit of rage, goes off on his own to try and take down the foot once and for all. He takes on, like, 20,000 foot soldiers on his own, fights his way through all of them, gets to Karas, the Shredder's daughter, stabs her almost lethally, and then finally falls, like, falling into the river and drowning after, like, yeah. being just covered in blood, having just fought his way through an army of ninjas. Raph's death definitely, I think, is the most fitting for his character. Yeah, no, it, it's worth mentioning that this the whole conflict started because uh, Karai is an asshole and um, <laughs> lied about a truce. Yeah. The Foot Clan had tried to establish a truce, but it was all just a trick. Karai betrays them, and then, you know, obviously the Turtles fight back, and it just completely tears both sides apart. <laughs> yeah, What? and of course, another added wrinkle of pain is that, like, they all didn't, like, die in the span of, like, the same night. No, the no. The same battle. It was, like, years. Like, it's it's accumulation of years. Raph um, goes. Raph is the yeah. Raph's the first to go. Raph goes and then first. Leo and Casey, mm-hmm. and then Donnie and Splinter. I would say um, with because Donnie and Splinter die together. I would say I like Splinter's death here because it's it takes place in Japan, which I didn't know that there were. Maybe it's only in this continuity, but I know there were more of the Hamato clan, like the clan that Splinter is supposedly from in Japan. I thought they were like the last of their kind. But they go to get like reinforcements and uh, also meet with the Foot Clan for like to establish a new peace treaty. It's obviously another trap. Uh, Oroku Hirodo, who's now in charge, tries to kill Splinter and Donnie once and for all. He does succeed, although they put up one hell of a fight, especially Splinter. Like, ugh, Splinter just tears through these guys. He throws his sword, <laughs> like, stabs it into Oroku's yeah. shoulder, and they only die because, like, a whole swarm of archers just rain down hell on them. Yeah, it's kind of, it was really tragic and poignant seeing Splinter, who's, like, the wise master, the sage, you know, the most disciplined, finally just kind of loses cool. Yeah, he's lost one of his sons. He's actually lost more of his sons, but I think that was the only one he knew of was Raph at that point because they had left. Just tragedy after tragedy, and he's standing there in his final battle. Just He's like, if I'm going to die, I'm going to take everyone here with me. <laughs> <laughs> and just Donnie futilely just trying to protect him from the, the wall of arrows coming at him, just like shields him, and then they're just, they're just both taken out by arrows. And mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> ouch. Yeah. Ouchies. Uh, I don't really... I know you said you like it, but I do feel like Leo... At, uh, Casey, I can see his death being good with Baxter Stockman just blowing him up. That feels right to me for Casey to just sort of go out in a blaze of glory like that. But Leo, I wanted something a little more poignant. Like, Leo just kind of is fighting alongside Casey, not as, like, the leader of the team trying to keep everyone safe, but more just like, you know, one last hurrah, let's fight off, and then they just explode. <laughs> like, I wanted him to be in more of a, a leadership role instead of just, I'm the last one who's going to hold off these guys. I don't know. I don't know what I wanted for Leo. It just, what the way he goes doesn't feel as thematic as the other deaths to me. Yeah, that's fair. I can see that. Um, I, I read it as sort of a subverting of expectations. Because mm-hmm. the way I thought it would go is, be like, um, Leo would be the last to go or the most poignant to go, but he's the one that kind of went the most un- unceremoniously, which, mm-hmm. <clears throat> like I said before, I, I kind of like the, the sort of the rug pull of that, but I, I can see just being disappointed in it. Yeah, it, it wasn't bad by any means. It was just, it was the weakest, I think, of the deaths. Because, like, everyone else went out just the way you kind of expect, well, not expect them to, but in a way that seems fitting to their character arcs, at least their characterization as I know them. But Leo was just kind of another one that kind of happens. Yeah, and the, the way that the narrative just finds a way to just 
beat them down Mm -hmm. like no quarter (laughs) is like I said before it could it sounds too edgy but like it's told with such like sincerity because it's co-written of course by the people who created the turtles so they know them the best yeah so it all feels earnest and all this is happening like while Mikey's just on a plane heading to Japan and like when he gets there it's just it's already too late Mm -hmm. so his dad and his his last brother Donatello were already dead so he just (laughs) He just, like, wonders, well, he just wanders off. Just, <laughs> that's when he becomes the last Ronin. Mm-hmm. Which, and, it's awesome. There's a new series, The Lost Years, uh, mm-hmm. that explores what he was doing during all that time. Because I just can't wait to jump back into this world. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> perhaps not the best that this is our first real foray into TMNT here. I mean, we've mentioned Rise of the TMNT a few times here, but for this to be the first one we actually sit down and review, it's not the most authentic representation of the T- franchise <laughs> yeah that we're reviewing here we chose a very specific niche element of the franchise to focus on by making this the one we actually reviewed first <laughs> why there's there's so much to talk about though it's got so many details yeah um because it's five issues but i think they're all double-sized issues mm-hmm. um so it's a lot of story uh mikey uh he sees and hears his brothers uh, yes he's haunted by their ghosts him. Yes, and they and they have the banter and, and, and the interplay that you're, you know, used to. Except they're all calling him out for his bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> because they're all just <laughs> representations of his guilt and grief. Yep. Ooh, just yay. <laughs> I, I like how that was resolved as well. Mm-hmm. I like that he comes to the realization that he has to push past that if he's going to succeed in what he's doing. Mm-hmm. He, he can't let them be in his head like they have been because after he's rescued by uh, Casey, is it Casey May, the daughter? It is Casey Marie Jones. Casey Marie. Yeah. After he's rescued by Casey Marie, you know, and reunited with April, he, he kind of realizes that, you know, their legacy has been kind of like living on and he's not, you know, completely alone. So that punishment that he's doing with himself he realizes it's a detriment and he tells him to to leave him alone and to mm-hmm. shut up so he can finally fulfill what what his mission is mm-hmm. i like um, how they don't all give him the same advice either like it could have been so easy for them to all dogpile on him but he sort of hallucinates them in a way where each one retains elements of their personality while also like plaguing him with guilt Like, Leo is the one who's telling him, like, you need to be more strategic. You need to focus on these opportunities. Donnie's the one who's, like, sort of psychoanalyzing him, being like, you're the one hallucinating us. You're the one who's plagued with all this guilt. And Raph's the one who's just pushing him forward with his rage. Like, each one of them represents a different element of his, like, grief and guilt that he's going through. They're not all just the same voice. Yeah, it's it's such a clever piece of writing to have them be true to their characters, yet also at the same time just reflecting different aspects of his guilt mm-hmm. that he's been carrying the whole time. It's, oh, mm, chef's kiss on that detail. I like Casey Marie. She's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, I like Grizzled April. She she kind of reminds me of Sarah Connor, like an old, like an aged Sarah Connor from Terminator. I wonder if that was purposeful. I wasn't sure about uh, Hiroto at first, but as the series progresses, um, they kind of add a bit more dimension to him and a mm-hmm. bit more layers to him. He's very different from both Shredder and Karai because both of them are such like powerful presences. I don't know as much about Karai as I do Shredder but with Oroku he's so just a spoiled brat turned psychopath it, th- but they play it so well because his insanity actually makes him intimidating. There's nothing, like I said, there's not much new or revolutionary about the story, but all the tropes they use, they use them masterfully. Like, he just kills his own guys whenever they start, yeah, you know. the whole underling killing thing. There's a, there's a part in, I think, issue two, where he's training with them, and one of them actually, one of his own men managed to actually land a hit on him, and he just, like, kills him just for, like, actually managing to hit him, instead of, like, because he's like, I showed, he made me show weakness in front of him, so they're all gonna die now. Mm-hmm. Of course, because the villains always kind of have to be a dark mirror of the, of the of the heroes, 
you know, they're both doing this for legacy's sake, mm-hmm. you know, for, you know, dynasty's sake. But of course, like, um, Oroku's is more twisted and self-serving and egotistical. Um, because at first he's kind of like, it's just my birthright. But then, like, that slowly gets kind of, you get a bigger viewpoint into it. He's He's, he's a mama's boy and he just feels like, psychotically entitled to it because he was indoctrinated with, you know, the training and the knowledge that this is all going to be yours. You know, you, you're entitled to it just by birth, by clan. He just internalized that to such an extent that he like, he can't see outside of it. And he's insane. He's been driven. In he's s- <laughs> very he's, insane. He's been in, in, cause like there's a whole scene where he's out on like the roof of his building in the middle of a storm, just screaming about his birthright and heritage and whatnot. And he's just, He's going back and forth with himself about, like, I'm living up to your expectations. I'm exceeding them, but you abandoned me here. And, like, he's talking to his mother. He's talking to Shredder. And he's just, he's losing it with this mix of, like, the burden of carrying on the Shredder's legacy while also wanting to stand apart from it as his own being, while also just being an abandoned child who lost his mother, while also being, like, the most feared man in New York He's just, he's lost it entirely. <laughs> yeah, he's hes what the Turtles would be if Splinter wasn't a loving father. Mm-hmm. You know, if the, if the family bond and the love wasn't there with the Turtles and Splinter, that's what they would be. They would just be about, like, the ego and the power and the entitlement. Um, I, I like how he keeps Karai alive in, in, like, a test tube just to spite her. Mm-hmm. And then he kills <laughs> like, her in the final issue just because he's like, you left me alone, mother, now I'll kill you for it in front of this Ninja Turtle. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, he's a psychotic little bitch. And he's, got, he's got his big old god complex. He screams about being a god in the final issue before Maki finally puts him down. And he's got some badass, like, liquid metal tech armor that's oh like, yeah armor yeah super cool super fun like adaptation of the splinter armor totally unique um, from it though because like you said it's like liquid metal so it's skin tight and like it yeah if, if, the, if the silver surfer had like <laughs> if the silver like surfer samurai and, yeah. accoutrement yeah that's a good way of putting it i also really like how casey jr she she's the um, culmination of the the mutagen through line. Mm-hmm. Um, through constant exposure, Casey and April carried on radiation from the mutagen and passed it on to their daughter. So she has a healing factor. She has some strength. She has some endurance. I don't, that's just, that's just like a cool twist on like bloodlines. Mm-hmm. It's like a it's like a it's like a cool flip on like the whole bloodline thing. <laughs> Because it's technically not, you know, she's not technically related to the turtles and and Splinter, but she is through that that mutagen. And, and it, it's a good uh, continuing of the sort of Ninja Turtle legacy because it depends on the continuity. But in I think the original Splinter is not actually a member of the Hamato clan. He was the pet rat of the last of the Hamatos, yes. mm-hmm. and he Hamato Yoshi. Yeah, and then he adopted the turtles, so they weren't technically, you know blood relatives of the Hamatos or anything. They were just animals that got mutated and Splinter had oh, a connection to the Hamatos. Uh, I, can't, I, I cannot keep the origins of Splinter straight between the, the, the different kinds. The, the big two are he was either <laughs> Hamato Yoshi's pet rat or he's Hamato Yoshi who she turned into a rat. Into, yeah. yeah, I just I can't keep straight which iteration has the you know, which I think, origin. I <laughs> think the original 80s and the well, I don't know about the comics, but the two uh, the cartoons. I think the original '80s and the 2003 cartoon. No, I think both of those were Pet Rat, and then for the 2012 and Rise, I think they did Transformed. So I think with oh, oh, okay, I think I got it. Yeah, um, older ones. He's the usually original, the pet. I think in the older in the original Mirage comics, he was the pet, and since the original movie from 1990 adapted a lot of the comic he's also the pet there and then in the 80s cartoon he's transformed i think so he is hamato yoshi is he in the 80s? 80s yeah i'm pretty sure he is hamato yoshi god it's hard to keep track there's so many ninja yeah, turtles so many <laughs> and they play with it too like the 2012 when i remember they have like a crossover with like the 80s turtles 
and the IDW comic does a really interesting thing with it where they're kind of like they're reincarnated from like the spirits of Hamato Yoshi and his four sons. Oh, really? That were taken out by the Shredder Clan, by the Foot Clan. That's interesting. It's I, really cool. I do need to check out the IDW comic. It's I've so seen great. so much. Co- I've seen, I guess, spoiler for anybody who's going to read the IDW comic. I've seen where Donnie gets his shell cracked by Bebop and Rocksteady. Yeah. God, God damn, that's brutal. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a, oh, it's so good. And it's still ongoing. Yeah. So, uh, the new turtles and characters they introduce look cool. I like that Jenica who's got like the yellow bandana cool. and like the Wolverine claws she uses. Last Ronin. Last Ronin. Um, we were talking about the mutagen uh, legacy blood through line. Mm-hmm. I guess we'll talk about <laughs> kind of how it ends. Ends the issue one and issue five are bookended. Mm-hmm. Um, Mikey in the begin like in the beginning of issue one, Mikey is having like a uh, kind of like a dream of remembrance of when they were all teenagers and training, and his brothers are kind of like playfully jabbing him and stuff like that, and while they're training, they're just having their turtle banter. And then, of course, because you know how these stories end. Uh, Mikey and Oroku take each other out, and then as Mikey is flatlining, it goes into that memory again. So, kind of like he's quasi in heaven where he wants to be reunited with his family again. Oh god, can we talk about his message <laughs> at the end of the journal from Splinter? Yes, such a such an understated way to, to, to get that across. Because he has he has oh. this he has Splinter's journal with all of his lessons that he ever taught the turtles, and he it's like his most prized possession. Um he's talking to Casey about it in like issue three and like the final message in it says no peace like no peace like there is no peace yep. and mm-hmm. as he lays there dying casey comes running to him she pulls out the book and she's like you've got to teach me you promised to teach me and he shows her the very last message he's altered it to say no peace as in k-n-o-w peace you must know peace and he's just like they're dying uh, <laughs> uh. Uh, <laughs> uh, emotional sign number 52 in this podcast um he's I so big like, i'm sorry i's looking at the comic panel right now like casey's dra- like, he's enormous he's like a mini hulk he's like yeah, seven he's like feet the hulk tall. of the turtle show on. <laughs> um i love how the, i love the way the journal thing is framed mm-hmm. because this is at least how I took it because Casey, she's all alone and the shit's going down Mm -hmm. and she's running back to the lair because it's flooding because of the final stand that the resistance is having against her too. She finds the journal and she's like, something's wrong. Mikey's something's wrong with Mikey. I don't know how maybe they intended for that to come across, but I took it as like, she thinks maybe he's just not all there. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes back around to like, I left that there for you. Because I know that I was going to die. And I want you to have these final lessons. Well, no, she comes... It's just like... <laughs> oh, she does pick ahead. up... I was going to say, she does come to him. He explains yeah. the message to her. But yeah, she does go and find it before she goes to meet up with him again. Yeah, she like explicitly like thinks and Thought Bubbler says, like, he wouldn't leave this out here. Like, there's something up with him. Mm-hmm. And, and then at the very she end, she use it there on purpose. Yeah. Then at the very end, she's got some turtles that April's got in like, a, like a terrarium, like they're going to make new turtles. Oh, oh the pain. <laughs> like I said, none of this is revolutionary, but God, they, the tropes, they do them so well. The art's beautiful, too. It does a, oh, it's so good. It's, it's like, surprisingly good. Highly detailed and like it perfectly captures that sort of like crazy post-apocalyptic look where everything looks grimy and run down but also like so extensively detailed like you see like shattered glass and just stuff thrown all about the place and it gives you this sense that like this place is barely being held together like all of new york is barely being held together (coughs) oh excuse me the action's Um, great and super easy to follow mm mm-hmm some of my favorite art in in the comic is the hyper detailed either like one page spread or like splash pages that they do across two pages. Mm-hmm. That's just like all just taken up by Mikey and his detail, his craggy face, his like age spots, his like rippled muscles and scars. God, such a 
such a harsh way to just be like, oh, that's Mikey. That's the party dude. Like, yeah. <laughs> also, the that's flashbacks. Like anchovy pizza. Huh? The flashbacks, too. They're done mm-hmm. with, like, this... The comic pages are usually just white on, like, the edges, so that there's not really anything separate from them. But whenever they go into a flashback, they change, like, a different color. Like, for Raph's black flashback, the comic edges are all red, and the whole page has, like, a tinge of red to it. So while he's fighting through all of these Foot Clan ninjas trying to get to Karai, there's blood splattering everywhere, but he's already just... Like, the whole page was already red, so you just feel his fury and pain as he's going through all these ninjas to get to his last enemy. Oh, it's so beautifully done. Each, like, there's layers to the art in the flashback. Like, when it's, like, a double flashback? Mm Mm-hmm. Or how how does the device go? Like, there'll be, like, a now or then little Yeah, title. there's a different art style that's done whenever Mikey is narrating his past. His memory, yeah. And it's, like, all black and white with his dialogue in an orange box, and he's telling that's- about what he went through. But then you'll get the actual flashback of, like, what happened in reality, because he does, he wasn't there for all of the events. He wasn't there to see like mm-hmm. Raph die or Donnie and Splinter die. And whenever he goes into that, it's all every time it goes into one of theirs, it has like a tint to it, some sort of colored tint. With Donnie and Splinter, it's sort of like a like almost a pinkish. Like, because they're, they're in this, like, snow snowy field, and it's, like, sunrise, and everything is just tinged pink as they're, like, fighting off all of these Foot Clan ninjas. Each flashback that has one of the turtles' death is tinged a different color, which is just awesome. Just a great narrative device to show the different ways that they went out. Especially with the last one with Splinter and Donnie and uh, their final stand. That's... Definitely huge uh, visual homage to, like, old-school samurai movies Mm -hmm. uh, visually because so many of those movies juxtapose, like, the violence of battle with just gorgeous vistas. The setting sun in the background casting just orange and yellow beauty across the sky and Mm -hmm. the, the wind through the wheat and the grass and, like, the 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 gentle movement of that and kind of like the, um... Just the, just the beauty of the Japanese countryside. Um, a lot of the images in that final... It's in a cemetery. Just, it's in a... Yeah, it's, it's, oh, it's so good. It's def, It's definitely a callback to those old school samurai movies, which um, if you're interested, uh, I can show you a bunch because samurai movies rock. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Mikey's past, that's in the art st- when he's like talking about his experience. Yeah. That's in the art style of the original black and white Mirage. Comics. Yeah, yeah. God, it's so good. So, like, it's it's like a culmination of, I guess, the original comics, not only in, like, story, but in um, visual presentation. hmm So, yeah, they, they really went all out with this. It's like a prestige book in, in all kinds of ways. I love Casey's costume, too. Like, Casey Marie. Her outfit is very simple. It's just, like, black and purple, but it's got, like, real sort of Batgirl vibes with her little black mask that she's wearing. Mm-hmm. Like, it's very cool. And she's got that, like, tight little pixie cut. It's really cool. <laughs> and even though it's grim dark, it does have its moment of levity. It does have its moments of levity. I like it when Mikey's training her. He's, he's like, really being, like, a stern sensei kind of, like, uh, you you did this wrong and you're doing this wrong, you know. Oh yeah, this, he's... This, you're not ready. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> he's like, well, you know, I'm gonna train you because you know it's the right thing to do, and blah 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 blah. And she gives him a hug, and it's like, oh. And then like she's walking away, and he's like, get a haircut. And then he's like, get a haircut? What the hell? Man? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I I was never meant to be a sensei. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and and seeing the one, you know, the the turtle that's either portrayed as just, you know, the goof, the jokester, the odd man out, the, the oddball. The baby brother. Yeah, t- taking on, like, a mentor role and a leadership role and being the responsible one and the one that has to be like, no, like, it's too dangerous or this, this it's my way or the highway. It's such an, just an endlessly fascinating dynamic for him. Yeah. Which just makes it all the more heartbreaking. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> oh. And I wanted to mention the um his 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 
his, mem- his fading memory slash heaven as he flatlines was the second time I cried. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. That flatline with them all together. They're standing on the rooftops of New York. The sun's coming up. It's beautiful. And Mikey's finally reunited with his family in heaven. And it's just like, oh, he finally knew peace. Just like he said. <laughs> just like he wrote it in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and who can say? <laughs> oh boy. I don't know what else to say about this. It's just it's such a good concise story. Like Yeah, they just they they, they knew exactly how to tell it. That it takes um, I will say it fits in a lot of Ninja Turtle lore. Like there are characters and ideas in here that I had no idea where they came from. Like who's the robot? Let me guess the fu- the fugitoid. Yeah. yeah, the fugitoid. <laughs> I knew nothing about the fugitoid. I'm like, what is he from? I don't remember him being in any of the shows. Yeah, he's in the he's in the old eighties one. He's in the Mirage comics. He's in the IDW comics. Okay. Um, I never watched the eighties series through. I've seen like a few episodes, but like I, I saw him and I'm like What's his deal? And he's like a major character, too. He's like the one who takes out Baxter Stockman. Stockman, yeah. Oh, God, fucking Baxter Stockman. Yeah. If I did have to have one criticism, mm-hmm. and it's not major, it's just that it, it, it seems kind of convenient that basically a, a crime boss was able to take over an entire city and sequester it himself, you know? And, like, that's just kind of what the future is for New York. Eh. It's a but yeah, thing. You, yeah, you can hand wave that away. But there's, it, it's kind of just like, oh, that happened. But it's it's not a big deal. Now, in a series as absurd as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I'm willing to let a few plot holes slide. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah, as long as the characterization <clears throat> is good and like the storytelling is done well, I can let a few like plot things like that because like big time crime boss takes over a big city turns it into dystopia that's just the staple of these kinds of stories yeah. like literally every story does that when they do this kind of thing yeah and you could just call it oh it's just old man logan with the turtles yeah or, oh, it's just dark knight Returns or future imperfect whatever you want to call it like this story's been done a million times and that's that's true it is but there's a reason we keep seeing those kinds of stories done over and over again because they tell us something about these characters and the sort of trials they endure and their perseverance through it and ability to redeem themselves from their lowest moments that make them so endear- like such beloved characters in the first place. The best thing I can say about this is that it made me want to start reading IDW all over again so I can have <laughs> my turtles together not dead as they're oh, meant I, to be. I, I'm definitely I'm definitely <laughs> starting the IDW run soon. Like you will not be disappointed. I'm sure me. it looks the art from it's beautiful. And like I said, all the newer characters that they've added look really cool too. I see. I've seen stuff where they're like starting with a whole new generation of turtles or something. Like that looks awesome. Oh, I'm not caught up. Um, I, I do have a lot to catch up on, but I read like at least the first mm-hmm. 100 issues, I think. And I think they're like over 150 now. And there's, you know, spinoff miniseries and, and stuff like that. Yeah. What else to say? But, ab- yeah. What else to say uh, about this one? Though? We're, we're in that spot where like we like something so much. Yeah. That we kind of just rush through our points. Well, it's um, like it's such a concise story. It's hard to sort sort of expand on it too much because it it does everything it wants to very well. Okay. Well, I will say that kind of t- tack on to your point about like this isn't like the best representation of it's the turtles not- <laughs> for, like, the first podcast. Yeah. Do not do not you do not read this. Even though we just spoiled it, the whole thing. Don't read this if you only have a passing familiar, familiarity with the turtles. No. It, like, it won't mean as much. This, like, you this, might enjoy it, but you're not going to have that gut punch. It's one of those it's, stories that is built upon an understanding of this world and these characters, and without that, it just seems like tropey, like schlock. Like, you yeah. just you just see, like, the surface-level tropes, and you're like, oh, I've seen this a million times before. When you see those tropes layered with your own personal connection to the characters, that's when it has its investment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that is kind of one caveat I'll say is like if if you just kind of sort of know the turtles or only saw like maybe 
the 80s cartoon when you were a kid, this isn't a good jumping on point for the comics. What would you say the best jumping on point for Ninja Turtles is, comic shows or otherwise? What would you say, what would you Honestly, introduce as baby's first Ninja Turtle? Honestly, um, there are multiple, like this, the reason why I love this franchise so much is that there are so many genuinely good jumping on points. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're a comic reader and like you love comics, definitely the IDW, the old school Mirage comics are very good and they have their diehard fans, but maybe not quite good and good for people who kind of want a more, I don't want to say generic, but familiar Mm -hmm. you know view into the turtles the the 1990 movie is just it's a classic in my <laughs> opinion it's amazing i was gonna say i grew up with the 2003 series but it's been a long time since i've watched it i know it's, it's good it's closer to the original ninja turtles comic in sort of the stories uh that it to tackles and also the general tone uh the 2012 series i'd say in terms of overall tone and style is a pretty good jumping on point because it gives you the general yeah. sort of connection between them. I will say that in its later seasons, it's sort of the formula gets a little old. I, Rise yeah. of the TMNT, as much as I love it, it really depends on what it does well is the fact that it breaks away from so many traditions of the TMNT. So I, I would think yeah, you would. It's, it's the black sheep of the franchise. Yeah. Unfortunately. I, I love yeah. Rise, but I wouldn't recommend it as like somebody's first introduction to Ninja Turtles. If I had to pick a top three, mm -hmm. I would say the IDW comic, the first movie, and the 2012 series. Yeah. Um, and also you can break it down by tone. If you want something more light and fun and just, you know, something kind of goofy, the 80s cartoon, uh, it doesn't follow any like overarching narrative or anything it's an 80s cartoon so right. if you just want quick 22 bites of just you know silly humor and, and cute animation go with that the 2012 series is a great mix of you know good emotional sincere storytelling with stakes and also silly comedy mm -hmm. and um the comics honestly the idw comics are probably the, the, the best representation overall i would say of the entire franchise ah wow, hot claim IDW has so many licensed properties that they just knock out of the park. They've got Sonic, they got the Ninja Turtles, they got Transformers, I think they got My Little Pony. They've just got like all these mm -hmm. different like licensed Mega Man. Yeah. Uh, like they just grab all these licensed properties and they're like, okay, we're gonna make our own continuity with like these established characters and worlds and make them like even better than what they were before. Uh, the IDW Ghostbusters comics are amazing, and they have a cro they do crossovers like crazy, and they're all mostly good. They there's an IDW crossover with Ghostbusters and TMNT, great. There's two IDW crossovers with Batman and TMNT, both great. That's what the animated movie is based on. I wanted of, to is ask the first six issues. Of I, that. I actually want to ask this. I know that the TMNT have crossed over with Batman a couple of times, but like. Why was there never any Marvel crossover with the team in T? Is there like licensing issues there? It could be a licensing issue. And to be honest, I can't 100% say for sure certain that they haven't done that. Um, I don't think they have, but there might be. I'm just, um, I'm not sure. I'm just thinking like Spider-Man with the Ninja Turtles. That just seems like an obvious fit. It really does. Um, let's just, let's see. TMNT Marvel crossover. Just give me a yes or no answer. Why can't Google just give me a yes or I've no gotta answer? I've got to get a bunch of, you know, doc or articles from Screen Rant and stuff. Like, did they ever do this? Did they ever do that? It's just tell Click me. Click to find out. Just tell me. <laughs> I'm going to say no, that they have yet to cross over with Marvel. They've teamed up with the Power Rangers, too, I know. <clears throat> yep, and Justice League and Power Rangers have an IDW crossover. That's awesome. Just He-Man and Thundercats and just... I could go on and on and on about the awesome IDW crossovers that they've done. Yeah. Anything geeky that you love probably I has an IDW crossover <laughs> comic book. And it's probably really good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so go check them out. <clears throat> Any last thoughts on Last Ronin before we move on to some other segments? Nah, man, it's just good. It is just good. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got something different for us. I was going to do a flex your fandom to test your trivia on Ninja Turtles. But instead of that, let's answer the age old question of which Ninja Turtle are you? 
Yay! So I'm going to send you a quiz, and we're both going to oh, fill this shit. out. Okay. Yeah, I sent that in Discord. We're both going to fill out this quiz and see which Ninja Turtle we are. See, th- this is where, like, the fanboy brain comes in, because it's like, well, what iteration? Uh, what <laughs> exactly. Version, uh... It looks like this one was based off the 2012 series. Let's start. Let's start. First question, what movie genre is your favorite? Our options are thriller, suspense, animated cartoon, comedy, documentary, romance, horror, science fiction, or heartthrob slash drama. I'm going to go with animated cartoon because I watch a lot of cartoons. Gee, what am I going to pick? <laughs> oh, second one is, what is your go-to activity when you're struck by boredom? Learn to practice a skill, start slash work on a project, watch television, go for a walk. Practice a sport or workout, antagonize or annoy family slash friends, <laughs> play video games, do a quiet activity alone. Uh, this there's is actually too, there's too many options. <laughs> this is actually <laughs> sort of two. <laughs> I'm gonna go with go for a walk because as much as I love video games, if I'm just sort of generally bored, I tend to just go get a walk in. I'm gonna go with watch TV. <laughs> I don't know if this is gonna make good audio or not. I'm just sort of. <laughs> I just thought this would be fun for us to do. This is playbuzz.com, by the way, if you all want to play along at home. Next question. What kind of exotic pet would you like to own? A wolf, an eagle, a parrot, or an owl? Why are they all birds except for the wolf? (laughs) Yeah, that's kind of weird. That's a weird choice. I'm going to pick the wolf just because he's the odd man out here. I'm going to do owl. Okay. How would you describe the way you think? Artfully, egotistically, wittily, logically, astutely, strategically, Impulsively, practically. Oh, probably kind of between wittily and impulsively. Yeah. I'm going to go with impulsively. I've never thought about the way that I think. <laughs> yeah, that's an odd one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go... See, there, I, I, I think I think in like polar opposite ways sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this, this quiz- in my day to in my day to day, I'm gonna go with practically. Tyler, you're telling me that a personality quiz breaking down your core components <laughs> into singular identities is perhaps limiting. <laughs> Oh, God, you got a lot to read on this one. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, okay. Also, it's dark. What the hell? You wake up and see nothing but pitch blackness. What makes your skin crawl? A, the sound of screams echo in the dark. You recognize these screams. They are your friends, and they're crying for your help. You try to run towards them, but you can't move. You've been paralyzed. B, there is nothing. Nothing to see. Nothing to hear. Nothing to touch. The only sound is your own breathing. You sit there for hours, trying to fall asleep to escape the lunacy of this solitude, but instead you lose track of time. How long have you been here? Hours? Days? Years? See? Hands are reaching out and grabbing you from all directions. When you try to run, they come with you as if they are attached to your skin. Or D. Weird. You start to feel little tickles all over your skin. It's just a passing breeze. If passing breeze have legs, what? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, um, which of those makes our skin crawl, Tyler? I'm going to go with the endless void of nothing. I'll go with everyone I love screaming and not being able to move, I guess. <laughs> that was a very big tonal shift. That was weird. <laughs> What dream have you had slash get frequently? Flying, petting an animal, stress at school, nightmare, uh, parentheses are scared but don't know why, teeth falling out, being chased, falling, end of the world. Nightmare is so broad. Nightmare is so broad. Like, there's so many tons of nightmares. I'm going to go with flying because I've had a lot of good flying dreams. I stupidly have stupid stress at school dreams. Still, that's hilarious. I get stress at jobs dreams where I'm like stuck doing the same monotonous task over and over and over and like builds anxiety. I get those sometimes if I have like a hard day at work. Stupid. We can't even escape that. (laughs) No, I've woken up sitting up in the middle of the night, like scanning things from back when I worked at a grocery (laughs) store. Like I'll be sitting up in bed, like moving my hand as if I was scanning something across the scanner. I'm like, the hell am I doing? It's midnight. If you were trapped in a ghost town for the rest of your life with one other person, who would you choose? An older sibling, someone you work well with but don't know very well, like a coworker, a younger sibling, your best friend, the person who raised you, or your significant other? 
Why wouldn't you? All right. Well, I, obviously, my choice is my SO. Well, fuck you too, then. I, <laughs> I was gonna choose best friend, but okay, I'll still do it because I'm a good friend. <laughs> Isaac, why do you why do you assume that you're not my SO in this? <gasps> Cause every time we touch, I get this feeling. So quick to be hurt when you don't even know the full. Did we ever tell the story of when we were just walking through Walmart one day and like you were, it was me, you and Erica and you turned to Erica to say something. He was like, hey, honey. And I was like, yes. And it wasn't even like a joke. I genuinely just responded <laughs> to you. To and just my brain was just immediately like, oh, he's talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the level of comfort we're operating on. Uh, and that was years ago. Anyway, your <laughs> turn. Describe your perfect day. Cool and bright with no clouds in the sky. One to two feet of snow on the ground. Ooh, snow day. Sweater weather with crisp winds and spotted clouds. Hurricane weather, aggressive winds, severe thunder and lightning. What the hell? Constant downpour. <laughs> Hot and sunny with a soft breeze. and Misty and foggy but warm. Warm, gentle rain, and rainbow prone. Who, en- rainbow prone. who enjoys actually being in a hurricane? Uh, I get- Floridians, I guess. Some people uh, like I'm storms, with- I get that. but I enjoy a storm, but uh, not so much anymore that it knocks my power out every mm-hmm. time a fucking bird shits on a power line. <laughs> I'm going to go with the snow day. I love a good snow day. I'm going to go with misty, foggy, but warm. Okay. You've struck a nerve on your best friend by telling them they aren't very good at something they enjoy. Oh, no. Oh, wow. <laughs> Oh, it's it's getting personal. They fire back the same insult adapted to your passion, then stomp away. What do you do? Immediately run after them and apologize. You may have been a little harsh. Run after them, lie and say you were only joking, and fake a nervous laugh. That was a close one. (laughs) Chase after them and scream back. You're angry and they overreacted. Wait it out. They will come back eventually and apologize, and then you will do the same. You were both wrong, and you're not worried. You're frozen in shock. You were only trying to give some constructive criticism, but it came out wrong. You're guilty and plan on apologizing, explaining yourself, and make it up to them. This is really personal. (laughs) It's so weird. It's like a really weird one. Okay, the the prompt doesn't seem to match up with the last answer. That it seems like too okay too much. So the prompt is you struck a nerve, one of their nerves, and then they say something mean back and stomped off. So you said the initial mean thing. You weren't trying to be mean, but it came off that way apparently. I I'm gonna, I'm gonna immediately run after you and apologize. I am gonna say that you've been a little harsh. I'm gonna say the same thing. I think if you suddenly erupted on me, I'd be like, whoa, maybe I overstepped a boundary. That seems like the only logical thing. Yeah, the rest of those are a little pick. psychopathic. <laughs> pick a group of colors that appeal to you. Oh. Pale yellow, white, bright pink. Jeez, I wonder which pink. Ninja Turtles associated with which color. <laughs> you know, I kind of forgot that we were doing this to pick which Ninja <laughs> so that didn't even register. That. <laughs> okay, uh, pale yellow, white, bright pink, deep red, translucent red, emerald green, forest green. Yellow, orange, dark green, silver, dark blue, bright yellow, yellow, green. Okay, so there's not actually a purple option. That's a lot of color choices in each one. <sighs> I'm going to go with deep red, translucent red, and then green, forest green. I'm going to go with dark blue just because it's the only one that's got a blue in it, and that's my favorite. Oh, of course, oh the God, last one course. is our Zodiac. <laughs> uh, why are there, like, a couple of these? Okay, so what's your Zodiac? And some of them are solo, but then others are, like, Cancer or Scorpio, Gemini or Libra. It's, why is it broken up like that? Um, uh, what is the sign that everybody that, that is like agreed upon is shitty? Uh, Scorpio, I think. Or is it Gemini? I don't know. <laughs> Erica just called out that it's Gemini. If so, of course, Gemini is grouped with what I really am, which is Libra. <laughs> All right, Tyler. All right. Time for our answer. I've got mine. Do you got yours yet? Calculating results. I am Leonardo. Are you kidding me? I'm also Leonardo. Oh, this bullshit. <laughs> this is bullshit. Quiz. You're a natural born leader with the rare ability to get your friends to listen to you. Most of the time, you find happiness in things others might call strange and dorky, but you don't mind. Morals are important to you, and you always strive to do the right thing for the greater good. You're strong, able, clever, and not afraid of adventure. Actually, you crave it. You need to be a hero, and you're determined to get there. You're so selfless sometimes, you end up hurting yourself. You put your friends and family before you and would sacrifice yourself in a second to save them. You may be afraid of failing them, but to their eyes, you are compassionate, understanding, and often the voice that reminds them what's important. They look up to you, even if it doesn't always seem that way. 
So we're both Leo. That seems <laughs> off to me. I, every time I do one of these stupid internet quizzes, and it's like it's in the outcome I don't want. I'm like these fucking things. They don't know <laughs> they're so lame. But then if, if it's if I'm happy with it, I'm like yay! It's so good. It's so <laughs> accurate. <laughs> I mean, I don't I'll accept it. I don't disagree with any of the character analysis there. I think we're both very, especially with the 2012 Leo. He is kind of a dork who's into like that. What was the show that he was obsessed with in the 2012 one? It was, it was like, like a Star Trek parody. Star, yeah, um, like a Star Trek knockoff. Sure, I'll take Leo. I, I'll take it. I will accept. I will accept Leo mixed with Wrath as my genuine character analysis of which Ninja Turtle I am. I'm surprised I didn't get Mikey. I usually get Mikey when Me I take too. a quiz like I'm this. I'm really surprised. You didn't get Mikey. <laughs> oh well, so there it is. We're both Leos. I don't know if that was good audio or boring as hell to listen to. We'll just have to listen. Well, to you're the one who's got to edit it, so you'll find out. And we'll find else. out. All right. Are we ready to rate the damn thing and be done with it? Should I? Oh my gosh. I No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm Michelangelo. Kind of a, Michelangelo kind of a is a daddy. He's a big old turtle monster and he's puking up blood half the time. <laughs> Kind of a silver fox without the silver. Kind of thick. <laughs> kind of fit. If you're thick. into that sort of thing, <laughs> he's only if you're into the whole cold-blooded lone warrior, green, kind of covered in wrinkles and cuts. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, we're gonna go with no on that. I think probably. definitively not. Like, what? Name one part of this that's actively horny. <laughs> <laughs> there really isn't. There's no sex appeal in this at all. There's whatsoever. really not. <laughs> April's in there like her 40s, and her daughter is the youngest. She's older than that. She's like in her 60s. Yeah. Her daughter's not sexualized. She kind of looks like Batgirl, but she's like fully clothed and everything. Like there's the closest her, is like her training outfit, and even that's like a one piece thing. There's nobody in here sexy. It's just big old turtles yeah. and rat men fighting against ninjas and stuff. And now that I realize it, uh, I'm going to knock a point off for it being uh, not sexy at all. <laughs> not horny enough. Okay. I think this is our second. I don't remember what the first was, but there was another one where we were like definitively like, no, it's not horny. Oh, man. Everything's got to be a little horny. You mm-hmm. know? All right. Let's rate the damn thing and be done with it. Uh, what are you going to give TMNT the last Ronin? <laughs> I'm trying to think of a clever slash stupid rating like I usually do, but nothing's coming to me for some reason. So I will give it five Michelangelo flatlinings out of <laughs> five new generation of baby turtles that Casey's raising. Aw, I'll give it three out of three Ninja Turtle ghosts haunting Mikey. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> anyway, I guess that's going to do it for us. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with your friends, drop a like or a rating. I'm not even going to bother plugging our social because we don't use it for anything. But that, uh, anyway, thank you for least li- blah, 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 blah. Why am I flooding? That's what I get for trying to break away from the tradition that I've set. Uh, thank you for listening. And remember, don't throw your baby in the trash or the sewer. There's turtles down there.